All right, we're back in plenary session, <laughs> joined by the one and only Dr. Vinay Prasad, Associate Professor and Hematologist Oncologist at the University of California, San Francisco, author of two books. If you haven't read them, you should check them out, Ending Medical Reversal, Malignant, and your very own host of the Plenary Session podcast. But today, you can probably tell things are different. This is a reverse host session. My name is Christina Janae. I'm, a, as my Twitter profile says, a recovering shift nurse, current <laughs> health policy researcher, and a collaborator in the Prasad lab. So welcome to your podcast, Vinay. Oh, thanks. The tables have turned. And now I think, are you only the second person to be the guest host? Or no, the third person after I, Timothy and third. Chris. Yeah. Well, Timothy, and didn't Audrey also interview you for medicine? She did, but I don't think she ever took this the helms of the host. I think Chris uh, did and Timothy did, so... Now it's your turn. Okay. Oh, and Logan did as well. Oh, Logan did. Okay, so fourth, yeah. fourth, yeah. Yeah, because right. I had to study those in order to pull off <laughs> this. Oh, this. boy. Oh, so boy. I've, I've strong-armed Benai today. I've strong-armed you to dish all the trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so today yeah. we're going to be talking about academia. We're going to be talking about the things that nobody wants to talk about. Mm, should you go okay. to conferences? Should you <laughs> publish? How do you publish? What should you be thinking about as a trainee? We're going to talk about it all. <laughs> so um, I guess, you know, we, I've talked to Vinay about doing this. I'm uh, uh, like many of you out there, a first generation, academic, first generation yeah. college student. I, you know, have found the process to be, very vague and and it's difficult to sort of understand and and having people like mentors and whatnot have been really crucial for me to sort of mitigate these waters and then you know i became a nurse and that was fine and things were very transparent because they have to be in medicine right you have to it's something you have to perform well so we but then i decided to go into academics and i found a whole new uh, area of vagueness and and gray and nobody would talk about the things that I thought was important and mm -hmm. whether should I be thinking if they're mm -hmm. important so I told Vinay that we gotta we gotta go on your podcast and we gotta make this a little bit more transparent for people so <laughs> okay buckle up <laughs> it's gonna be a bumpy ride <laughs> yeah I guess I will uh I, I guess I'll I'll tell you the unvarnished truth that's all I can say yeah. that's that's my only yeah. promise all right and the disclosure, you haven't, just like Logan, you never yes. saw the questions. I haven't. Time, so. And in fact, the way you talked about it make me so nervous. <laughs> I'm pretty nervous no. about what these questions are and how, <laughs> how much I'm going to have to. I, I promise to tell the truth, but I don't promise to tell, you know, you can omit facts. I mean, that, that's, always a, that's always a prerogative. So anyway, I mean, we shall especially see. Especially in a competitive area. Like, I mean, academics is always competitive. You know, oh, okay. Well, that's one thing that many I mean, people don't say. Yeah, of course so, it is. Yeah, it is. Maybe it's. it's Maybe it's not supposed to be, but you know, in any industry, when you're buying for a limited, limited spots, and as I understand it, I'm not, uh, I'm not a scientist yet, but you know, I understand that you know those positions are getting smaller and smaller each day. We have more and more people graduating with PhDs, so you know, when I say competitive, I mean that sort of you know buying for a limited number of spots, and with any area like that, there will be people who, you know, take it to the next level and will start to compete. But anyways, we fielded questions on Twitter. Right. I I got Vinay to, to tweet to his thousands of followers <laughs> and we fielded some questions from Twitter. And then we like half were about COVID only. And so we're like, okay, right, screw that. Yeah, no. Yeah, we, we, have delete yeah, some yeah, of we have to delete some of those. Great. Okay, okay. We'll come yeah, back this to is, academic this, We're going back yeah. to the true season four, is it? Of Plenary yeah, the, the, the motive, the, the, no zero, the hashtag zero COVID plenary session, zero. yeah. Zero but COVID it didn't plenary. stay zero COVID. Well, it's... you know, what am I to do when they keep changing the mandates and stuff? Okay, fine. You're right. You're okay, right. Anyways, I didn't, I didn't keep that. my promise. I didn't keep my promise. No. But we're going back to the true essence of season okay. four, which is zero COVID. Yes. We're, this is academics <laughs> only. Okay. But so we fielded a whole bunch of questions. And, you know, you got a lot of different questions. You got people yeah. who are considering medicine. You were people that were in training. How should I think about academic medicine? And then yeah. you got quite a few people who are actually maybe similar stage, um, you know, of the career of where you are. Um, so, you know, trying to figure out how they should run their labs and how to recruit people to labs. So there was a whole bunch of different questions from different stages. So I figure what we'll do we're going to walk a very brisk walk <laughs> to the clinician scientist, to the professor route. Mm. We're going to start right at the beginning with medicine, 
because there was a few questions about that. So from what I understand, so we're just going to jump right in. What I understand, you did a philosophy undergraduate, correct? That was, yes, I was, uh, my, I majored in philosophy and, um, and physiology. I was kind of on the fence. So I was uh, interested in science too, but I was a double major. Okay, and I ended so up you, giving the, yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean, I guess, but I, I feel like I identify more as a philosophy major. One, because I ended up giving the commencement speech on behalf of uh, the College of Arts and Letters for philosophy. And uh, there were fewer of us. And you had much more uh, sort of intimate relationships with the faculty. You were closer to them. You talked more with them. Uh, I, I would I would say that that was my passion in college. My passion wasn't the science classes. Why? Because not that I don't love science, but in a class of like 200 people in a massive auditorium with, you know, filling out a bubble sheet for, our, right. our, you know, that's not really a great educational experience. But in philosophy, you're talking in a room of five, seven people, 10 people with the professor, writing papers, getting feedback, discussing. It's much, it's a much better learning environment. Right. So why medicine? <laughs> why medicine? I guess I would say... Um, is it too late to change? No. <laughs> um, I guess nope. I would say no. that one, there were a lot of things that now in retrospect, I see that I would have been good at that I just didn't even have on my radar. Some of those things I think are like economics. I feel like a lot of what I do and we do is like kind of economic thinking or health policy thinking in medicine. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know about economics as a major, I don't think. And I didn't even envision health policy and health economics as a PhD. It wasn't even on my radar, but that could have been a fit. The other thing I think about is I like to think about how to craft arguments and, and sort of debate propositions. And mm -hmm. so I think law would have been sort of another natural fit. But at the time, it wasn't really on my radar. And why medicine? I guess I was also interested in doing maybe a doctorate in philosophy, and I thought about it. Um, but I always felt like as much as I enjoyed philosophy and some of the classics and the thinking, I always felt like sometimes it was too abstract and not practical enough. It didn't have sort of, uh, an anchor in the real world. And sometimes it felt like sort of argument for the sake of argument. Um, medicine to me was sort of, uh, nobody in my family is in medicine. It was, it was sort of, um, in the shadows, you know, I, I didn't really fully understand it. But to me, it felt like a great place where you could have all these sort of deep questions about life, the meaning of life, death, health, as well as take care of people and try to make them better off, as well as, you know, bring science into it and try to think about, you know, what does science mean? And even in philosophy, I kind of gravitated to like philosophy of science classes as well. Mm -hmm. Like, what is science? What do we know? How do we know what we know? Those kinds of things. I think that's a really nice combination. I, when I was in graduate school and even in nursing, I always took philosophy courses as my electives. I, I really like the way, I really love to think deeply about one subject. <laughs> and, you know, and that doesn't necessarily make you a very good bedside nurse though. So <laughs> you had to go into <laughs> academics for that one. But um, what, what advice would you give students based on some of the realizations that you've had? About going into medicine? About going into medicine, yeah. Um, I so there was a the, question on Twitter about yeah. what advice do you give aspiring med med uh, medical students? Well, I guess I would say that, um, you know, if you would ask me then would I be doing what I'm doing now, I, would have, it wouldn't, I wouldn't have no conception of it. And so I think that's okay. You can follow your own path. Medicine is a versatile degree. You could do anything from, you know, go into pharma to, um, you know, uh, go into journalism, as some have done, to go into be a professor, to be a practicing clinician full time. So I think it's very versatile. I think the things you need to be prepared for are one, it's a long haul. Like you can do four years of medical school and you will have the title doctor, but you won't really know what it means to practice medicine. And then some people were upset that I said this, but I think even if you do your six years of training, you really still don't have a really deep sense of practicing medicine because it's very different when um, you have the buck stopping with you that you have this sort of weight of moral responsibility in the way that a trainee, of course, will have some weight, but they always have the attending to run questions by and they are not the legal authority. And I think it is very different. And, you know, people who don't feel that way, they will feel that way the first few years on faculty or first few years in practice. I think they will start to feel that way. Like, wow, um, I appreciate having had that sort of attending above me, um, even if they sort of gave me a lot of latitude. Um, so I think that, you know, it is a long haul that to like really practice what it means to be a doctor. And so you should be prepared for at least a decade and probably longer to kind of work on the craft. Um, the next thing I would say is it's a profession that 
is very hierarchical. And I think that it's tough for a lot of people, particularly people who want to be empowered on day one, that it's not a profession where you're empowered on day one, unfortunately. And you're often not empowered on year three or year four. Sometimes it's not till year five or six that you're empowered in the sense that like you actually have the competence that you feel like you, you know what you're doing because the, the amount to learn is so vast. Um, I think, you know, if you're doing it for the money, I always think that's the wrong idea. I think that's probably um, the biggest misconception people make because um, the giving up a decade of earnings, particularly in an environment where people who work for Facebook and Google and Twitter, um, including some people who live right around me, probably make much more money than I do and probably have made more money than I have um, since they were 24, you know. Um, so I think you shouldn't be doing it for the money. You should be doing it if you like talking to people, caring for people, um, thinking about evidence and thinking about how to make healthcare better. Um, and I think I advise people that like you should really be doing it if your passion is clinical medicine and like taking care of patients. If you want to do laboratory stuff, I think, yes, you could be a doctor as well, but you know, you don't have to. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm surprised people were upset about that, actually. I mean, as a nurse, I always felt I was so happy that I always had someone above me, you know, yeah. I was taking the orders and, and I sometimes would imagine, oh my God, you know, if this was, you know, this was just me, how do you actually make those decisions? Like you have to be pretty good with. And, it, and it's not, it's not, a, and... it's not, an, yeah, it's not, I don't think it's a knowledge issue. And I, and it's an issue that no. like, I mean, as a, as a, when I was in my final year of fellowship, I felt like I knew all the answers, you know, because I had a, a good amount of book knowledge and a good amount of practical knowledge, and I felt like I knew the correct answer. But it's very different when it, one year later when you're the attending and there's no one to have that final chat with. There's no one who says, good job. You put that answer in and you live with that answer and you're all by yourself and there's no one yeah, to talk huge. to. That's and huge, then, yeah. Something bad will inevitably happen to somebody, whether you made the right answer or the wrong answer. And you will agonize about it in a way, yes, you've agonized before, but you'll agonize about it in another way. And so I think, you know, yeah. it's, I mean, what are, we to, what are we to think? I mean, of course, medicine, of course, what do they call it? It's practicing medicine, meaning that you're always sort of rethinking through. I'm very different in the way I practice now than I did five years ago seven years ago when I started on faculty yeah. and 10 years ago when I started in fellowship, I'm very different. You will keep changing, you know, I think it's inevitable. And so of course the, what it means to be a doctor will keep maturing in your mind. But I certainly think that after medical school, that's not even close to being a doctor. And even these other parts of training, it's just the, it's just the first step in and there's a lot more to go. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly can't imagine. Um, getting into academics. So you had mentioned that you had considered doing a PhD in uh, in philosophy, uh, in philosophy. Yeah. and so this is a conversation we've had offline before because you know i'm a nurse i have a master's degree i've I'm very strongly contemplating doing a phd um should should someone do a phd and so i know this differs <laughs> in medicine because in medicine you have a potential and i don't know enough about this and maybe you might elaborate on you know the choice someone might make as a going in to, and to do an MD or they come to you and they say, you know what, but I really want to be a, a clinician scientist. I'm going to do an MD PhD or I'm, I'm an MD now or a nurse. And I now want to get into academics. I'm considering doing a PhD. What do you tell them? I guess I would say that, um, you know, PhD is a lot of years and it can be a long haul and it, the pay is abysmal. And then you have to do postdoc and postdoc and it's abysmal as well. And I guess I would say a few things. One, you know, what are you trying to do a PhD in? And I think usually in biomedicine, when we think PhD, we think like molecular biology or biochemistry and to run sort of a, a laboratory in the conventional sense with beakers and pipettes, just like all the pictures in our website. Yeah. <laughs> beakers and pipettes. I didn't pipettes. even catch that right away, but that. <laughs> it's all a satire, but people don't see it. Okay, anyway. Um, so, you know, I think people um, think about it in that sense. And what I would say is, and I've had a lot of friends do it. I've had a lot of friends who did PhD only and they wanted to run a lab. And I would say, I think that's almost the hardest path out of college these days. It's terrible. I had one friend who was at Harvard for like 17 years after college, and then he finally got his first lab, and he applied to like hundreds and hundreds in more than one year, and he got one job offer, you know? And uh, the job market is abysmal. Uh, the funding is so tough. 
um, the pay is so low. So naturally, and and they're and they're mint and they're they're churning out so many PhDs a year that they don't have enough spots for these people. So they have to go into industry and all these other things. And I think if that's the path, then you have to ask yourself, like, do you need to devote so many years of your life? Could you do a master's? Could you do a few projects? You, for instance, when we talk, you know, it's kind of a to me, it's kind of silly because, you know, you've done many, many more times of research than sort of many people do in a PhD program. So I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's just letters and. And I don't have a PhD either, but at this point, you know, I think I've done many more times of research than anyone with a policy PhD has done in their PhD training. So I think like, you know, you, you can learn these things outside of it. Um, I think if you're going into like physician scientists, the MSTP route, I'm not the expert, but um, since I didn't do it, but you I think it's- You have some opinions though. I've I heard, have some I've opinions. <laughs> One of my opinions is that like, well, my opinion is that the federal government is subsidizing this program and the federal government is not doing the proper studies to know if we're getting our value for money. We're sinking like a half a million dollars into every MSTP, but, um, you know, is that, does that have a good return on investment or could we take that money and give it to people who have finished the MD to do a PhD in their fellowship or to, you know, pick up research while working? I don't know the answers. Or but even I think, a master's. Or even right? a master's. <laughs> Yeah. As a physician, I mean, it is different as a physician because you do, and I don't know if this is just the way yeah. that your training or the culture of being a physician is that you, it seems like research is more baked into the culture, whereas I reflect on, so as a nurse, we don't have very much exposure to research at all. So, you know, we end up having to go and do, you know, master's degrees and PhDs. And if we want to get into academics, and this is where I push back a little bit, because whereas if I want a faculty position, I basically have to do a PhD. You know, there are very few jobs out there that have, you know, a tenure track job or a faculty job that specifies that I can only have a BSN. Like I need a PhD hmm. versus, you know, as a, as a doctor, as a, with an MD, you uh, can often seek those faculty jobs without a, without a lot of postgraduate training. So there is sort of a differential and that might just be, you know, the way the the training is in medical school versus other professions. But a lot of times, you know, you do have that ability, whereas other people don't. But I definitely hear what you're saying. But how many papers job. have you published so far in your career? I mean, I, we're getting up towards 20 probably by now. But that's not, you know, I started my graduate degree in 2018. Someone asked me what data I was working with. I didn't even know what data meant. Nice. <laughs> really, but, I didn't but I guess I had no my, idea. My point is that I think it would be, I don't know, people need to realize, are you <laughs> making somebody do the degree because they learn something of value or are you making them do the degree just to have the letters? And I think that when somebody's yeah, published 20 papers point. as you have in top journals and you know, I've worked on some stuff with you and it's very methodologically well done, I think, you know, I mean, you know, it's pointless. I mean, you have a PhD, it just they just never gave you the letters, but it's, it's a silly yeah. distinction. At least in policy, yeah. you know, I don't have a PhD in molecular biology and neither do you, but you know, that's a different business. Yeah, but we're not. But we're <laughs> yeah, not molecular biologists. Yeah. We're not trusted in those labs and you shouldn't put us in there. But yeah, no, it's uh, at this point, it's sort of just another filter in order it's to another apply. Fil- and- yes. It's another thing to check off on the prerequisite list. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but these MSTPs, I feel, I, I often feel simp- I mean, one of the things they say is that they have a higher rate of staying and running labs than just the regular MD. But of course, that's not a fair counterfactual because the kind of kid that came out of college so motivated to do that program is not comparable to the average kid who did an MD. So what would have happened if you had some sort of natural experiment or random allocation? And I suspect, looking at the numbers myself, I would be hard pressed to believe that there is any uh, huge advantage to having done that degree. And to be honest, we're talking about people who are, you know, 40 when they get their first job. I mean, it's a long haul. And so I think you really need yeah. to think twice if you want to it's pursue huge that. Haul. Yeah, huge we have haul. the similar program in Canada, but it's very, they're very small and they're, they're not small. very, mm-hmm. I don't think they're as common as they are in the United States. But. And they're only common in the U.S. because the NIH is paying for them um, with that subsidy. Yeah. 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 So think hard, think long. If you're going to do a PhD, I have. <laughs> I'm yeah. still thinking still to this thinking. day. Yeah. But so another thing we're going to, we're going to move to okay. training. And so another thing you mentioned was, you know, the, the pay, the pay is, the you know, as a, in academia, you take a pay cut, especially in, in the United States. And, you know, I listened to, I remember, you know, going back to a podcast you had with uh, Chris Booth, you, so you, both of you were sort of talking about the differences between Canada and, and where, where you don't take necessarily that big of a pay cut, you still do as a mm-hmm. practitioner or as a clinician when you want to do academia. But in the United States, it's 
quite like it's quite more it's more significant than it is in Canada so <laughs> with that in mind with the pay cut that you have to take to do what you're doing for someone who is in oncology who's considering academic medicine versus going into practice how should they make that decision how did you make that decision you asked Chris this and I want to know from you huh it's a good question and I guess um what would I say? I'd say a few things. I'd say, um, I feel like, um, at least my point of view, if your predominant goal is to take excellent care of patients, then I think you can do that in private practice or the academic environment. And if your predominant goal is to take excellent care of patients, then I think you have to ask yourself, why do you want to be in academics and be making maybe 50% or, uh, of what you could be making per year? And why is that important? Because I don't know, if you make enough money that you don't need to work again, that gives you a lot of freedom in life to do whatever you want to do, wherever you want to do it. And so I have a friend who literally went into the most lucrative private practice he could when he finished his training. He's in a different specialty, but now he's made enough money seven years into his, fac into his career that he's even talking about uh, taking a year off going to New Zealand or even stopping entirely. He's got enough nest eggs saved up so he could probably, you know, and, and that's a very interesting position to be in so early in life. Um, you could pursue all sorts of things you're interested in and even do continue to do medicine, but just not at that same, you know, pace. Um, I think if you're interested in clinical trials, it used to be that you could only do them in the academics environment, but now look at what people do in U.S. oncology, Texas oncology, things like Next Oncology, these startups, these private companies, mm -hmm. um, they're running clinical trials the way an academic is and often getting compensated better or having equity in the company. So I think that clinical trials may not always be a differentiation point. I think people say like, well, I really like to work with trainees. I say, sure, you know, you can do that in academics, but also look at people at the VA. They often have trainees or people in um, sort of places like um, – maybe like a, 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 a Providence or a Cedar sinai sort of these privademia kind of hybrid places where there's some trainees, um, but also uh, it is a private environment. Um, if you want to run a lab, then I think uh, university environment is still probably the most likely place for you, unless you want to go straight to Genentech and try to be more applied. Um, there you'll have to figure out how you're going to do your half-day clinic. You probably could volunteer at a local hospital nearby. Um, and in my case... When I started in medicine, you know, I wasn't that, I, I mean, the sorts of papers that we're doing now, they weren't on my radar, but I started reading a lot of great books by people I admire, Marsha Angel and uh, and uh, Jerry Avorn and others, and, and I gradually ended up drifting into this space. Um, and um, for me, I think the advantage is, is that I'm in, interested in ideas. I'm interested in, like, truth of science and ideas, and our research agenda is unlike, I don't think there's anybody at this university with a similar research agenda. I'm not even sure there's any, there's very few people in the whole country with a similar research agenda. And globally, I think there's maybe a handful of people interested in these topics. And so I feel like we do fill a niche that nobody fills. And, um, and, uh, and I don't think I could do that outside just yet. Maybe someday, I don't know. Um, but I do think people have to ask them. I mean, I think that it's easy to have inertia and just stay in the university because you were trained in the university. But you really have to ask yourself, is that the right place for you? And I think your exposure to other places is often very low. There's no rule that says you can't go shadow someone in private practice for a day or two. So I would advise people to do that. Shadow as many people as you can. Go to pharma, shadow, go to this place, shadow. Shadow all these walks of life and see what's a better fit. And shadow for more than just a day. Shadow for a week, you know? I think it's, it's important. So someone also asked in this line uh, on Twitter, what do you enjoy being about an actor or what do you enjoy about being an academic that you can't find anywhere else? Is it this idea, this ability to focus on one thing? This... I think it's that like, yeah, I mean, you have more freedom to pursue what you want to. In a perfect world, you would have total freedom. You would be tenured and you would have freedom to pursue any idea you wish. Unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world where everyone gets up in arms when they hear anything that's slightly, that they find slightly unpalatable. But for instance, in the last year, what are the topics I've worked on? You know, just look at the range and tell me what job you could do that. One, we published that 60,000 word analysis um, that originally came out as a working paper, but now has been accepted in a journal that's going to be sort of, uh, yeah, it got accepted. I, I, and, I know, it was a good, it was good because a few journals take articles of that length um, about wow. the evidence for community cloth masking. Why? 
I don't know. People kept talking about it all the time. I got interested in it. I started reading paper after paper after paper. I read 40, 50, 60 papers. And then I start talking to people and we do decide to do sort of a broad systematic review. Um, I did papers with you on uh, representation in clinical trials. We've done papers on new drugs being approved. We've done papers on... Um, Oh, everything in cancer from yeah, sensor, accrual. accrual, censoring, randomization, control arms, uh, things on post-protocol therapy, um, papers on uh, uh, this person in our group is working on a myocarditis analysis for vaccines. Um, so, you know, it gives you a form, you know, you can think about vaccines and safety and you can think about drug approval and you think about all these things. And so there's what job, you know, you work for a company, they're not going to, they're going to have you focus on their agenda. Um, but pretty much if I have any idea, I can pursue it. And who is to stop yeah. me? No one will stop me, you know. Um, <laughs> well, uh, one potential yeah. place that could stop you, and this is jumping ahead, but someone had asked this question as well, was how do you sort of make time for your interests versus what the funder or or maybe someone you, you know, need to turn and work for? Or, you know, there's these funding requirements that we need to sort of adapt our ideas to. Yes. But how do you sort of mitigate the two? I guess I have always had, I mean, I guess I'm lucky in the sense that the what we're funded to do is low value medical care and identify those practices um, in, in oncology and outside of oncology. And that is a huge portion of our research team. In fact, probably 85% of our projects are in that space, like 100% in that space, because that is what I'm most interested in. Um, some of these other projects, some are actually in that space. I mean, you know, if you're talking about whether or not governments should be spending billions of dollars buying fourth and fifth boosters, you know, that's a that's a question of value. Um, but for other projects that may not fall perfectly within that purview, I think you know you do have your personal time, your free time to kind of explore those. But I would say my, the one the one th the one reason both of these things that you talked about are reasons why I think people are qu like quitting from the academia so quickly. One. Um, that they went into it to do something you could easily do outside the acad outside of academia and get paid more. So as time goes on, they eventually smell that I could be doing the exact same thing I'm doing now and get paid more for it. Why am I doing it on this side? So they didn't really explore the options at the beginning. I think that's part of a failure. And then the second thing is they are trying to um, do things for grants that they don't want to do. Why did you write that grant? You don't really want to do that. And then you did it because you wanted to keep your job and go on the next step. But that is really really unpalatable. You know, when I was in residency, this guy, a very smart guy I trained with, um, he asked this philosophical question. He, and let me ask this to you. The question was this. Um, if I paid you a million dollars a year, that's the job, million dollar salary. So it's an unthinkable salary for us. I mean, it's way more than what we would, we yeah. would make. A million dollars a year. But here's your job. It's only 35 hours a week. Only 35 hours. Very low, okay? But you come into a desk and you sit at the desk, and you take a piece of paper from the left side, which is red, and from the right side, which is blue, you put them together, you staple them, and you set them down. You're not allowed to look at your phone. You're not allowed to like, you know, sleep at your desk. You have to do it. You don't have to do it fast. You know, it's low pressure. No one's gonna yell at you for doing it slow, but you just gotta slowly and steadily do this. Staple the two pieces, staple the two people pieces. Would you take the job, is the question. Would you take the job? I mean, as you're saying, the million dollars a year and the 35 hours, you know, I'm thinking of the Fairmount Pacific Rim, which is downtown Vancouver. It's a beautiful <laughs> location. <laughs> Anytime I go into the Fairmont, I'm always reminded, why do I do this? Why haven't I chosen a job in pharma by now? But anyways, but what what I think about, you know, after I leave the Fairmont <laughs> yes. is um, I derive a lot of meaning from my work. It's who I am. Correct. I've come to the hard realization. And trust me, life would be a lot easier if I didn't come to this realization. Yes. I've tried, but I haven't been able to get there. I am an academic at heart. I like thinking deeply. I love to write. I love to go into, you know, go into especially publicly available data, which I think like most of your work is in almost, I guess maybe even a hundred percent of your work is in, which drew me to your work originally. And it's just who I am. And I've come to that realization in my older years as I wish. <laughs> and I wish it wasn't because life yeah. would be a lot easier if you sat at that table, you know, stapling those papers, well, making a million dollars a year. You can do anything you want, but I don't know. This, I couldn't I have know. said would it better myself. No, I think yeah. exactly no. for exactly what you say. 
which is that you only have so many hours on this planet and they could pay you all the money in the world, but I can't give you 35 a week to staple that fucking pay. I can't do it. And because, because I, uh, you know, I want to think about what I want to think about. I want to push it the way I want to push it. I want to write what I want to write. Um, and I'm interested in the Academy, what it really meant from, you know, Aristotle to today. I'm not interested in the Academy. What really? people want to make it into an arm of pharma. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in like what the Academy has always meant. And so, yeah, I have to do it, even if it is uh, often thankless. It's, that's the conclusion we come to. <laughs> yes, that's the, that's the um, How, okay, let's, so you've written a few books. Mm -hmm. um, you've Just written two. a book, your first book you wrote with Dr. Adam Sifu, Sifu yeah. um, which sort of brings up, I wonder about this idea of mentorship. So you wrote that book, you were done your master's I think that was it so mm -hmm. was he a, was he a professor of mm -hmm. medicine when you were in medical school and you had met so is this sort of a uh, mentorship and I'm just kind of trying to get at how important you think mentorship is or if you think this word is overused in the academy well I hate the word but I will say that Adam Sifu <laughs> is, is probably uh, one of the most important people in my life uh, why I, do I feel so like such an affinity for him? Because one, when I was a student, I was a uh, kind of lost. Like I didn't know what I was going to be interested in doing. Um, and then, uh, you know, you always find people you connect with, uh, especially in clinical medicine. Um, cause you rotate with so many different people. And I really felt like I connected with him one, because sort of, I loved his thoughtful approach to just the day-to-day -day medicine. And then two, I took his fourth year elective, like how to read and interpret clinical trials, which, uh, a lot of the classes I've taught over my career have been uh, a cheap knockoff of his class. Um, and why do I like his class? All we did was we'd read like seminal journal articles. We'd come in and we'd argue about it. And it was great. It was just great. He's like a great reader, points out all these pearls. We argued. We talked about the pros and cons. Um, and, you know, I always felt an affinity for him. Um, maybe also we have a similar sense of humor. Maybe he was, he won't, he won't want me telling you. <laughs> we have a similar sense of humor. We still to this day, I've never met him. <laughs> still to this day. I feel like I text him every day or every other day. And there's some, there's one other, one of my classmates who the three of us are, are very close. Um, and um, the book Ending Medical Reversal and all the papers on reversal came out of some conversations we were having, like when I was a third year, fourth year, and actually more when I was a fourth year. And then I was an intern um, in the same city. And so occasionally we'd meet for lunch and talk about these things. And I, I would draft some stuff and send it to him. He'd edit it, send it back. And eventually we decided to write a few articles. It was tough to publish. I'll tell you the first few articles, like nobody, they're like, there's, there's, they, they didn't believe in medical reversals. They were all, you know, and then eventually we did some empirical work um, and, uh, and it led to the book. And I think the book was kind of his idea that like we should kind of put these ideas in a long form. Uh, it was fun to do. Um, and so, uh, but I, I think that the reason I hate the way people use the word mentor is everyone's like, oh, I have this mentor, that mentor, this mentor. I mean, I mean, you're lucky in your life to have three people like this kind of relationship I've, I've been fortunate to have um, in your whole life. That you actually feel like you could actually like tell honestly what you're thinking and argue with and stuff yeah. like that. And, and learn especially from, who yeah. are superior to you, who Correct. it's someone maybe senior to you in your career, which is so rare to have that those power, power imbalances to be, you know, leveled or somewhat leveled that you can, you know, actually honestly speak to without worrying about repercussions or, or whatnot. But um, I think it's also yeah. overused, you know, when I was in graduate school, we had a formal mentorship program and I think it helps, you know, it helps meet people ahead of you and you can ask questions that you're maybe too afraid to ask professors or, you know, just, um, so it does help, but it never went anywhere. You know, it always sort of fizzled out. It was, you know, yeah. we got to meet and I always engaged in these things because I think mentorship is really important, but it always fizzled out. So I think you're right. It's, it's really rare to find that. But it's really rare. And that's why I think, I hate the way people use the term. They abuse it and they cheapen what it really means to find somebody you really click with and connect with. And now I, I still joke with Adam that I am now the age he was when we met, I think, almost almost to the day, almost, you know, very similar. Oh, and, wow. I, and I tell him that I remember thinking what an old man you were <laughs> <laughs> when I was a student. Oh, but, uh, yeah. But now I know that it's can't so be that old touche now it's touche now, now the shoes on the other foot thinking, yeah <laughs> yeah i'm sure logan now logan thinks i'm that old yeah now we're doing this podcast trying to get this wisdom from this old man, <laughs> old, man <laughs> old man um but yeah i think it's 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 very rare i mean the term is abused and it means all sorts of things but it's very rare that you find someone you really connect with and talk to for decades and i think that's yeah. what mentorship is yeah
Yeah. So I guess maybe even going back to the advice for students, look out with people, look at who, people who are doing the things that excite you, right? Yeah. How to get involved. People, people who are doing what excites you or people who, I don't know. I think sometimes it's so simple as like you're in a lecture and somebody gives a talk and you're like, oh, wow. I really feel that they're saying things in a way that I really like. And maybe I'll, you know, you go up to that person and say, hey, can I join you in clinic for an afternoon? Or can, uh, you know, just can I come to round with you when you're on service? Just let me know, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, go out of your way to try to like connect to people you like. I mean, there's, Sifu is of course one of the terrific people at UFC, but there's this guy, Scott Stern, who I thought was just a consummate clinician. And I always tried to learn as much as I could from him. And um, every time I saw he was giving a lecture around, I would try to go to the lectures, you know, and, um, I also was when I was on campus, like University of Chicago. Um, there were some, there's a there's a guy who passed away recently. He was a scholar of uh, of Martin Heidegger, and he was teaching a class. And I would go and I'd audit his class from the back row because I'd heard such great things about him. And it was a great and it was worth it, you know. And so I think like when you sniff out that someone is good, you latch on to that person, or you go to all their lectures, or you know, even to this day, if I if I sniff that somebody is good, I'll read all their papers. Yeah. <laughs> I can attest you do do that, yeah. Yeah, and and I'll email them sometimes. Oh, I remember. Yeah. Anyway, it's another story. But I remember. Well, no, I, yeah. Yeah. Go. go ahead. Tell the story. No, I guess there's like when I was a student, I read papers by this one person. Uh, his name is Alan Brett. I think he's in South Carolina, and he wrote a paper on perioperative cardiovascular screening, and it was in vogue back then. And his paper was in circulation, and it was just a devastating takedown. And that paper, you know, people talk about mentorship, but what is it? I mean, surely you are mentored by papers you read because I don't know the guy. I never met him. But the paper was both like saying something that people weren't saying and two, just so logically laid out. By the time you finish that paper, you cannot disagree with the man. It's like such a perfect devastating takedown of something we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I emailed him to say that it was like one of the best things I ever read. And uh, he wrote back that like, you know, uh, he really appreciated getting such an email because, you know, it's not often you do in this career. And uh, so I think you should write to people if you if they really connect with you. But you know what I also want to say? Don't bullshit people. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, don't tell somebody you like their work if you never read it. And don't. Yeah, you, they can see through it they in can a see second. Through but I don't know if they can see through. I don't know. I just think it. I I think it's stupid. I mean, after it a while, it, it, yeah. it doesn't help. Well, the other thing I'd say is like I feel as if Twitter is a forum in which people kiss up the people they don't actually learn from, respect, or admire. It's not a genuine thing. It's just an just a sort of networking thing. And there are people who may get lots of publications from networking with millions of people, but they will have no sort of core research agenda. They don't stand for anything. Um, and I think that will hurt them in the long run. But we shall see. Mm -hmm. I, I like that idea, though, about mentorship, even from papers and ideas yeah. and following people's work. You don't, you know, I think there's a misconception, especially at a junior level, that you need to, you know, skip all that and just go straight to the professor and say, you know, teach me. There's like sort of this passive uh, assumption that, you know, you can't do anything on your own in order to get better. You know, you need to be taught, you need to do things. But and I think that's really important is, is looking at papers, looking at how the argument is constructed, looking yes. at what data people are using. And especially, you know, that was one of the things that drew me to your lab as well, that you were someone talking about things that I was noticing and I wanted to be a part of that. But that also relies on the person, you know, the person on the other end, the person who emails you back, that professor emailed you back, you emailed me back, like, you know, there's a this sort of a push and pull that right. creates a good relationship moving forward, whether you want to call that mentorship or not. But but no one can stop you from learning from someone's written work. Um, Absolutely so, not. I mean, print yeah. those papers off, yeah. deconstruct the argument, check yeah. out the data. I've learned Absolutely. so much from people that I, well, I only met them years later and then, you know, I told them how much I admired them. And yeah. Um, and some of the books that were like terrific in medicine anyway. But yeah, I think you're right. I yeah. mean, mentorship is both the people you meet who you connect with. It should be genuine. Don't, I think if you, uh, you know, a watched pot doesn't boil. If you look for a mentor, you often won't find one. Uh, you need to like let it be more organic and find the person you resonate with and then, you know, yeah. try to latch on as much as possible. Yeah, and do the things that you like to do. So it increases the chances of meeting other people who are in the same space. Absolutely. If you know what that is. But yeah. so I want to talk about, I'm going to take a slight detour into some of the act, academic activities and then we're going to finish at the, you know, okay. the life of the professor. Cause I don't okay. know, I don't know, but there was a lot of questions about that. Publications, conferences, 
there's things that we do. We, you know, sometimes for argument's sake, we build our CVs, we do them. We don't know if they're, they're worth it. Um, but one of the things that drew me to your work is that you publish in multiple different areas. Like you're very active academically, you have over 340 publications, um, a lot of them in high impact journals, but you also publish in lay media and you, you know, especially this year or the last year with Atlantic time. I mean, it doesn't get any, I don't see a New York times, but maybe it's in the Mm. works. (laughs) You know, there's only one in my career on uh, Nobel prizes in 2015 in New York times, but yeah. But there's a there's yeah. a, there's this division. But something, I guess, I want to know how do you think about publishing in lay media versus academically? If your goal is to seek these academic positions, because I, there was a tweet that so I really like to publish, you know, journalistically or, or in lay media as well. But I remember a tweet that you had, and it said, you know, the academic the academy only really looks at peer review oh, yeah. publications. This, that should be your focus. And I remember doing this sort of like weight in my head being like, oh, no, I better, you know, start doing studies more instead of, but you're very active in both realms. So I want to know, how do you think about spreading your time and ideas in these realms? And then does that change if you're, say, you have a professor position versus when you're a trainee? Yes. So I guess I would say, uh, I'm, I, my, my philosophy is I'm active in every realm. I'm active in it's true. Podcast. podcast, YouTube, YouTube. Substack. Uh, I was the a link col- and subscribe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Like, subscribe, and leave. This actually would be on YouTube probably. This will be on you. So like, subscribe, leave a message below. Uh, if you've okay. gotten this far, you probably have. But yeah, you've already done it. Yeah, of course, if they're listening to this long. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm active on these things. I was debating recently to even go on this TikTok, uh, but I was debating. Okay, uh, anyway. Um, yeah, I see the cringe. You know, I, I see. I feel that too. Well, it's popular, um, but... Um, you know, okay, uh, publishing papers. Uh, why? Why? Um, you know, I listened to the economist Tyler Cohen on a podcast, I think recently, and somebody said, "Why are you doing all these things? Why do you make an economic podcast? You're an economist. Why don't you just write papers?" And he said, "You know, I want to be influential. I want to influence the ideas. And so I think if you want to influence the ideas, you should need to get off your high horse. That the only way to influence the ideas is in the peer review literature, and you need to influence the ideas wherever it may be, from op eds to videos to whatever." I want to influence the discussion. I feel, and I wouldn't want to if I felt as if somebody was saying exactly what I wanted to hear, which I thought was the right answer, but I, I seldom feel that way, especially with COVID-19. I feel like people are saying things that I think are very silly and demonstrably silly and run countered evidence-based medicine, et cetera. And so I feel like somebody needs to say this thing. I, I can understand why people don't want to. It's a hostile climate, but I feel like we have sort of a moral duty beyond ourselves to say the things that are true. And at the moment you feel as if you can't say what you believe in your heart is true, you start to die as a human being and as a society. I mean, what are we talking about? We want to live in a world where people can feel all these things, the majority of us, we can't say a word about it. For instance, isn't it silly that you have to wear the mask over one earlobe while you eat a bag of pretzels for 15 minutes and somebody tells you that that saves life? Isn't that silly? You're not wearing it for half the flight. Okay, anyway, anyway, I'll put that aside. Put that aside. It's not a COVID. Okay. Hashtag zero COVID. <laughs> right, zero, hashtag zero COVID. Okay, but we have to live in a world where we should be able to say what we want. Okay, but I also think that the Academy, I hate to say it, it shouldn't reward, like I shouldn't be promoted because of my op-eds. I'm doing my op-eds for another reason, which is I want to influence these ideas. I can't do an academic paper on some of these issues, honestly, because the window to influence the idea is so short. We're going to have you know, a booster EUA coming. Could I really write a paper, submit it, wait two months for a review, submit, submit? I did that once for the J&J stuff. We wrote a paper with um, uh, Pratik Kulkarni and I that we published, but it came like eight months after the whole thing, you know? So it's just not responsive enough to what we're dealing with. So you have to write op-eds, I think. And also many, many more people care than typical in oncology where it's only like a small fraction of people. Um, I also, that's why I feel mixed feelings about TikTok because like as any old person cringes at the newest, ther- at the newest you know, media, but part of me also wants to say like, you know, maybe I shouldn't cringe. Maybe these kids are onto something and I shouldn't be such a, old man Luddite, you know, maybe I should join. I don't know. I'm, I'm debate. I always debate. There's only so much time, but there's lots of doctors on TikTok. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I see. Content is disputable. But... Content is disputable. That's the key. <laughs> yes. That's the key. Um, but what I would say is that, I mean, if your goal is to be promoted as a professor, you should do that based on original publications, uh, not even, and maybe some commentaries, but peer review articles. Um, once you feel like that's going well, 
then I think you can look at other things. Um, but that's not to say that's for everybody. I mean, you might want to be a, uh, an academic hospitalist who only does YouTube. That's fine. That's just a different, it's just a different tract. I mean, you're not running a research laboratory. It's just a different path. It's perfectly a fine path. It's just different than what I had set out to do. And I think that, but I, but I do disagree with people who say, oh, I should get promoted for my tweets. Really? You should get like full, you should get like tenured professorship because of your tweets. Do people say that? Yeah, people say that. People say that. People say, I should get promoted for my podcast. It's educational. You get a tenured professorship for your podcast. I mean. You don't think so? There's a lot of, there's a lot of work that go into podcasts. Yeah. And impacting. And there's a lot of work more that goes into. More scientists are now starting podcasts and they're impacting a large yeah, uh, but it, it's society. Okay. Yes. No? These things are all these things are all true, and there's a lot of work that goes into like building a bicycle and painting a house, but it doesn't mean you get <laughs> professorship for you know. Okay. What, what do I mean is like what does it mean to be a like okay? What is the the philosophical thing that gets you professorship? The philosophical thing is you are not only engaging with ideas, processing them, interpreting them. You are literally generating new ideas into the world and proving and bolstering those new ideas and whether or not people like my work or don't like my work i believe and i think that they may finally have to admit that we are the people like our team have literally put some things in the consciousness that did not exist before post protocol therapy crossover that paper i did with allison i think invents the framework that everyone is using to talk about crossover they have forgotten where they learned it you know i think well we were the first to articulate it malignant tries to do that these you know reversal was a lot of empirical work um i just don't think you can do a podcast and take down a paper. I did one last night. Um, but you can't do a podcast and say, here's a new idea, medical reversal. It occurs with a 46% frequency rate. That kind of idea is only suited for a peer review publication. I've never seen anybody generate an, a totally new idea on a podcast. I've seen them take ideas that have existed and push them and disseminate. But I mean, may, yeah, maybe they'll prove me. the formula. Yeah. Yeah, that's usually the formula, formula with journalism and everything. It's sort of what I've uh, come to realize is, you know, you do the original research and then the, you know, the journalism or the, the you know, the lay media will take those estimates and sort of explain it in a more broader way. But and, and um, maybe there's a rationale to it. Yeah. And maybe the rationale is this, which is that if you are really debuting a novel idea, before you can let that be broadly broadcast to the world, at least get three people in your profession to let it pass a whiff test. Because it's a lot of new ideas are just like the first thing I'd say is like, oh, that's totally wrong. You actually don't know, you know, there's like all these flaws with your idea. So like, I don't know. I do think a peer review publication is key to really talk about something entirely new. Right. But you were saying, yes. I guess, how do you balance that in your career? Like you've always been active in lay media. That was one of the things that drew me to your work. I really love that sort of division, but you know, Tyler Cohen is, was a professor. I forget where I, I want to say Harvard, George but Mason. I don't think it was hard. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, a great institution. And then, you know, at the <laughs> tail end of his, or not, I shouldn't say tail end, but like, you know, in this part of his career, he's decided I've read his blog, you know, he's opened a blog and podcasts and whatnot. It's really interesting, but he also got to where he was through publication. So, I mean, I guess yes, reflecting on, you know, where, where we are now with the advent of a lot of podcasts and YouTubes and whatnot, how should people be thinking about, especially in that training stage, dividing their time? Should they be starting podcasts? Should they be um, fo still focusing on academic ideas? When they have an idea in their head, should they go, you know, try and pitch that or should they actually go and maybe try and turn it into an original research article, even though it comes out eight months later, you know, how do you... Yeah. Think about How did that. you do that? I guess. Well, I guess that, yeah. I guess a full disclaimer. I mean, I uh, like the things I do. I don't think about doing for like my career attainment. That's not a goal of mine, in fact. And like, I think people should ask themselves: Do you want to be professor because you want the title of professor, or do you want to be professor because you want to be the person who does the things a professor does? To me, professor is somebody who's constantly trying to generate novel empirical insights into the world. That's what a professor of science is. But somebody who wants to publicly disseminate science, like my good friend, Z Dog MD, he's a gr probably the greatest. I think he's perhaps even the single greatest extemporaneous medical speaker I've ever heard in my life. The man is gifted. Yeah, he's really good. Really good. And I think people underestimate his talent, if anything, because he makes it look so easy. His goal is not to be an uh, uh, original empirical factory. He's not a professor, but he has a great job. I mean, you know, he makes a show, and it's a terrific show. So I guess I would say, like, if you're an academic and you want to make a podcast, you have to ask yourself, 
do you want to make a podcast to disseminate the ideas that you're working on in your laboratory? Or do you want to make a podcast to talk about the events? In which case, does it really matter to you to be professor or not? Like, what do you want to be professor for? Like, maybe you want to just be just like- It comes uh, back to what you want. What do you want? Yeah. Really thinking about what you want. And I guess, and, and like, what you want, like, what did I, like, why do I want to write the reversal paper? Because like, I really felt very strongly about that. Why did I want to write that crossover paper? Because I was like, so furious reading these things, so furious reading these things about it, it was like totally wrong. And then I was like, well, we have to do this and set, settle this issue. And so um, I also think that like a mistake people make that leads to dissatisfaction is like, they think that you're going to get promoted and get all these glorious things in the university if you just do all these things. You should never be that way. You should think about what what do you love to do? Do you love to talk about things no one has ever talked about, collect data? Like I think you and I are much more on the same wavelength here because that's yeah. what our core love is, is like, you know, that project that you did that you're submitting right now, like I love that because it was like the like was, people have been talking about this for years and you collected all that data and you ran that regression and it gave us the answer that like no one has ever seen in the history of the world. And someday they will see it once these reviewers wisen up to how good it is <laughs> Once they, well, speaking of which yes, okay. like on that topic you know how do you how do you think about or how do you manage like publishing these pieces who that do go against the narrative of the time like you've done that a lot with you know yeah, cancer. COVID, but yeah, yeah. Cancer, and cancer before and cancer, that yeah of course but back in evidence-based med yeah. you know any medical reversal was that's really you know back then back then yeah, still back then. now to this day is still really novel but it goes very strongly against the narrative um so and journals are more likely not of course to, that i understand to publish that type of research so how do you how do you how do you manage that you've got your mask study you know the ah, 60, yes. words. that's right you just keep going until of someone of course yeah. you can't let them stop you i mean that's the other thing like just as um uh what would it be if we lived in a world where you couldn't say what you thought when it was like obvious and common sense and half your friends are telling you every day? What would it be in a world if you let people who are holding clearly flawed and wrong views stop you? I mean, reversal, what did they say at the time? Like 10 years, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago when we we're starting to do it, they said things like, um, you know, yeah, reversals happen, but they're super rare. Like an earthquake in California. Yeah, like we get all worried about it, but it's like once every 10 years or something. That's really bad, you know? And I was like, no, they're not, it's not like that. Let me prove to you it's not like that. And let me think about ways to dispel you of the myth. Um, and what did they say about the control arms? They said, oh, yeah, you found an example where the trial had like a, a flawed control arm, but they're like super rare. They don't happen that often. Then Talal publishes the estimate that's like 17% of all registration studies, like one in six. You know, that's like not yeah. nothing. So I think like you have to think about how do you win the war of ideas, and it's not one sh in a short term. Uh, COVID, I think, of course, it's sapped into a different part of the brain that's not rational, and so – you know, it can lead to a lot of errors. And so you want to push back gingerly. But, um, you know, I think there's like a misconception. Like, I'm not pushing back on the narrative because I enjoy pushing back on the narrative. I'm drawn to places where very smart people are saying things that are just like absolutely wrong. And I wonder, like, where is the misconception lie and try to show that to them? And they do change their mind. I will say that genome driven cancer oncology work we did seven years ago, they talked about how every patient will benefit from this. We published that paper in JAMA Onc that shows it's like, you know, 9% and Allison published yeah. the update 11. And now they say, well, you know, we always knew it wasn't everybody, but the people who do benefit, benefit a lot. They totally changed their narrative. And in their own mind, yeah. they've rewritten the history of what they used to believe, which is what people do when you really get new data, um, which is yeah. okay. I'll take it. Uh, but I think that, the, that, that if you want to publish papers, and if you want to be an academic, the thing that no one tells you is you've got to deal with rejection. Every paper, I mean, I don't know, you said you talk about how many papers I have, but I probably have 2000, 3000 rejections, and yeah. some meaner than others. And then you talk about all the op eds I write, but how many mean things have somebody said about me, probably a million, probably a million just in the last year. <laughs> yeah. you, how do you, you deal with it? How do you deal with the hate? <laughs> just that is it's like you, know, you have a I, video we should link link to that video link to that video that was older i feel like i've adapted my yeah. thinking even more um i don't know marty mackery told me that like you just do your you just do your thing and then i have another friend who says um he's an he's a wise man he says what's your mission in life what's your mission you set your own mission and then you do your mission and don't let anyone distract you from your mission you know what your mission is i know what my mission i mean i feel like i know what my mission is um you know what your mission is, so don't let them phase you. And uh, and then I think that, I think this is like a teaching that goes back like thousands of years, but your emotional state is under your control. 
You know, what they do to you and what they say about you, that's their control. But how you feel about it, that's your control. And uh, you know me, I'm never, have you ever seen me unhappy? No, I don't think I have, actually. I've never thought about it, but no, I don't think I have. You're always in a good mood. I'm always in a good mood. I'm always in a More good so mood. than the rest of us, I think. Even, 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 when, I, in the morning. even when I just got like scolded or something or somebody yelled at me about. Well, I think it's so often that, you know, we come to these lab <laughs> meetings and I will say things like, oh my God, I'm so mad about this thing that's happening to you. And you're like, I'm okay. I haven't even yeah, thought Sometimes about I don't even know what you're talking about because I haven't, <laughs> yeah. I don't look. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, like I, I get so frustrated for you. It's just yeah, so. Well. But I'm you know true, what? Look but... look at look at the way it's gone. Now uh, I'm not. Um, maybe for a few t for a brief moment in time, I was the punching bag du jour. But now it's moved to a new person. Now I feel bad for the new person. New person is punching bag du jour. And and we're here. I'm talking strictly about COVID nineteen. I mean, let's be honest. Why do people care so much? People have been whipped up into a panic about COVID nineteen for good reason. It's a real threat. But also, some of the panic is disproportionate to the risk, particularly particularly in children. And naturally, even after vaccination, it's very difficult to kind of find your sort of center point again. And when you're in that kind of state, I think it's easy to lash out at anyone who says something you don't like. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's me, but sometimes it's lots of other people. And so the anger gets directed and then it, you know, it doesn't become about issues. It becomes about people. And that's a mistake. Um, yeah. So just understanding human beings, really. <laughs> I think a lot of people have chosen to stay out of We're COVID. We're not rational. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people chose to stay out of COVID. That's fine. I think that's good yeah. for you, somebody who's still early in their that's career. But, done, yeah. but tenured professors, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed by them staying out of it because, you know what? Why did they give you tenure? Did they give you tenure just to rot there on the couch? Or when you see the single greatest crime being committed on children, the school closure, you keep your mouth shut and then you go and do disparities work? Your disparities work is this important in life. This issue is this important in life and you're silent on this issue. What does that say about you? Why did they give you tenure? A coward. A coward sitting on your leather chair. You have tenure and you keep your mouth shut. It really pisses me. It really bothers me that. That bothers me. Of oh. course, not, <laughs> not a young person. Not a young person. Yeah. A young person, you know, they're very worried about going to get a job. Okay, I understand that. But somebody who's got the comfort being silent. The global oncology people, you know, they, I've, you know, they got under it's my It's hard skin. to go against the rhetoric of the time. Like, I mean, I, I'm not, this isn't an excuse. This is like purely just yes. the way that I look at the world as a junior, you know, as a trainee. It's like, you don't want to go against the rhetoric of the world, dude. It's it's fierce out there, right? You know that. It's, but no, I think like it's, it's, it's forgivable. Not, it's easy. You don't have a permanent job. You don't have a permanent job, so I can't. I'm no. not gonna fault. I don't fault anyone who doesn't have a permanent job. But somebody with a lifetime tenured appointment. Oh, completely. Yeah. Okay, but uh, back so, to back to the cancer stuff. I mean, COVID will be over soon, and nobody will, you know, my work, you know. So I'll be back to where I was. I mean, I think in medicine we have an obligation to like talk about screening, blood blaze screening. We talk about financial conflicts. We talk about Biogen and this shitty Alzheimer's drug. We talk about, you know, these are real medical issues and they are really bankrupting Absolutely. people and bankrupting society and we need to do something. Absolutely, yeah. And that's, I feel the same way. That's my mission. It's terrible. Yes, and especially as a physician, you see this. You see I this. Know. You're a practicing physician. You see the detriment. When I was a nurse, I spoke to people about their financial ruin and mm -hmm. it, I saw what it looked like. So yeah. you just can't ignore it. Can't ignore but it. But speaking of, publications i want to know so you publish in a lot of high impact journals mm -hmm. your most cited paper is in jama network open which mm -hmm. technically on an impact factor you know scale is not the high like it's high but it's not as high as some of those big journals that you publish in often mm -hmm. so impact factor is it worth considering or is it rigged now uh, well you know i always say that um uh, it is worth it to some degree because even though it's a lousy, flawed, and shitty metric, it is what people read. People more likely read New England Journal and JAMA than they are likely to read um, the journal you never heard of. So don't you want to write in journals that people read? Yes. JAMA Network Open is an interesting journal because even though its impact factor is nascent and changing, it is a journal that a lot of people are reading because it's open access yeah. and you can tweet the link and it's like visually very pleasing. Um uh, that's that. So, I mean, like, yes, I aspire to publish in top journals. And yes, sometimes we're lucky and we get top journals, especially David Benjamin, by the way. This guy, he just got another one, by the way. He just got another one. David Benjamin, I don't know. He's the man. He's a, He turns everything to gold. He has the Midas shout touch. Out to shout out to David Benjamin. Sounds I got to get on to your team. And you and, you and Mark on the BMJ, you were like minting BMJ articles for a while. Okay. So, you know, you get lucky streaks. But um, when you have work you really believe in, you know, you want it to come anywhere. And, and I think you're absolutely right that like my most cited articles, I think all of them 
uh, are in like, you may not have guessed which ones. And that one article on the original reversal article in the Mayo Clinic proceedings, um, it got so many citations. They mailed me a, like, I have a plaque. They mailed me a plaque. I've never gotten a plaque, but they mailed wow. me a plaque of like five years later for like being one of the most cited articles in the journal um, because it struck but a how chord. About, how about politics? So it might not oh. matter in citation, but how about politics? So like if you're thinking about tenure, if you're thinking about seeking an academic job, do does impact factor affect politics? If I it guess, doesn't affect citations, it like might a, affect citations. Like, but. yes, that like people will always look at your CV and think more favorable of you. But I would say that like, if you're, I mean, I don't know. I hear people always saying like, I'm thinking about my promotion, thinking about my promotion. I like, don't think about your promotion. Here's what you need to do. Pick what you really care about and then just do so much good work in that space that who can deny you? Even your greatest hater will have to concede that this person has done so much work, even though I hate everything about it. How can we say this person is not deserving of being a professor because they've written two books and they've written all these articles and they've written like hundreds of articles and they got it in so many different venues and like, you know, by any objective metric, unless you're like the most biased human being on the planet, you got to concede. And so that's what I think everyone should be doing. I think what some of the things I see people do that are errors is they're not working on their passion space. They're working on something displaced. They're too scared or too cautious. Uh, life is short, you know, and writing it. I'm like, you know, scared to publish a peer review article. I mean, what's the worst that ever happened to somebody publish a peer review article? Somebody didn't like, I mean, got a few nasty tweets. Somebody read it? So, yeah, somebody read it. Yeah, right? Somebody read it? That's the worst? What's the worst that ever happened to him? I mean, it, like besides a fraudulent article, which I don't know we should ever do. Um, so I think like be brave, find what you care about, just do that, ignore other people, push on, you know what your mission is. That's always my advice. I think that's like the running thread of this. The advice in this episode is just do what you do what you like. Yeah. Do a lot of it. Do good work. Yeah. That'll increase your chances of getting lucky and maybe getting into maybe not. Maybe not maybe getting to a position where you can influence, you know, what you feel is really important in the day, but or maybe not. And you know what? If you don't, then you're you're stuck doing what you love. Anyways. Hey, and better to die on your tweet, feet than live on your knees. Yeah. There was this tweet about the career of Taika Waititi. He's the Ooh, director. Who? He's a new, you know, Taika Waititi. He, uh, he's a pretty well-known director. He directed oh, okay. Thor Rag Ragnarok. Oh, yes. Okay. The yes. Marvel. And he's from yes. New Zealand. So he, oh. there's this whole thread of him. I retweeted it last night, but it was um, just basically how he never set out to become this big international Marvel oh. director. Um, he was, you know, winning Oscars and whatnot. He did what he loved. He played music. He he uh, painted. He drew. He you know kind of went with the times and got into film. And because he loved it so much, he produced good work. And this sort of mm. what you're saying is making me think of that thread because it's it's the same but just in a different discipline. I think that's the most important maybe takeaway point of this whole thing. Absolutely. You know, it makes me think of one other thing though, which is like it's like a cultural thing that's different than when I was in college. Um, like um now i think so many young people are thinking about like what can i do to get the next rung in the ladder um but what i would always say is you should think about what can you do to make yourself better whether or not they give you the rung you can't control whether or not anyone's going to give you some promote rung on the ladder you can only control what you spend your mental energy on if you're going to spend that you can staple that paper for a million dollars you know that's wasting your you know you can only control what you choose to do and you can only control who you are and so what i say is like um early in my career and even to some to this day, I did like, I don't know, is it exercises? But I had a routine. Just like we have re exercise routines. You and I, you're a runner. I'm a cycl cyclist. Um, and I always say on the pot, uh, you know, when we were talking, I always say like my idea of good exercise is when you feel like you're going to die for like an hour. And uh, you said that was like too hard. And then I was skeptical of the evidence. Yeah. yeah, I was skeptical of the evidence that supports that claim. <laughs> well, we can look at this. I'm, we can look at actually, that. I'm sure there's exercise physiology. Well, okay. You should spend at threshold. <laughs> so by the way, okay, that's another nice thing about being uh, in academia, because now if we really wanted to, we could do a deep investigation of like how much should, like what is the data on exercise and how lacking is it? In fact, maybe we should do it. It's kind of, I'm kind of interested. Actually, but, that's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I believe that exercise should be done at the near death space. And like the harder you do it, the better. I love that. And then I, I mean, but there. not for not for like longevity or health, just for like the 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 reminder of like what it means to like not be suffering. Um, and similarly, I think you should do the same thing with your mind. Like for many years, I would alternate reading a medical book and a hit fiction book. I've gotten a little bit behind lately because I've just had a lot more to do, and I 
been more sleepy. Um, but I still think you should be reading medical books, reading regular books, reading articles. For instance, last night, you know, I did that Ivo Sidonibeza thing, and I spent an hour, but I worked on it pretty hard. I could just feel it like I was like in the zone when I was working on it. Um, and uh, I think you need to push yourself. You need to read more, and uh, if you want to write in a journal, you should be reading that journal. Um, Absolutely. You need, to, you need to like read more stats and learn more. But I don't feel people like give that advice, which is like make yourself better. That's the advice. Make yourself better. Uh, you know, uh, that's important advice. I like that advice too of of reading a book outside of your discipline. Oh, like yeah. your your backgrounds in philosophy. I mean, the first few papers you publish because you know I went back in time mm. and checked that out before this podcast I might use my sleuthing skills mm. and I went back in time but like those papers were essays they were all published solo and they yes. were essays using you know like philosophers they were philosophical yes. arguments in medicine and it was it was you never know when those ideas will actually be important and we have such a fixation on what we think is like the thing that will result in the thing but you never know when you read fiction how how these other things will come into your and benefit you even in a totally different um discipline and i remember in a podcast you had like a was it an eighth grader that came to you that wanted to join your lab and publish yeah, something some high school student yeah uh, yeah that's i mean and there I told you go them to but you told life. them yeah and read some books and read go traveling. Books. <laughs> i remember when i was in that um yeah that's what i that's what i did you know and also i mean my god what a what a sad life to have to be doing this like working on papers when you're like 16. I don't know. This was, I think it was yeah. like a sophomore in high school or something like that, but yeah. Yeah, it's sad. But the last thing with this okay. deviation, and we're going to talk about the life, or maybe we'll just jump right in, the life of the, the professor because we've okay. been going long, but there were people that had that had questions. But people. Um, labs, <laughs> how do you recruit good people to your labs? I don't know. <laughs> they keep coming uh, too, don't they? <laughs> We've had a lot of good people in our lab, but uh, is it anything I did? Well, I guess a few random things. One, you know, when um, I when I hire people, at least you know, like we don't use the interview as a judge. We basically, um, we we basically like look through all the applications and we like give people like a task to do, which like mimics the job, and then we blind ourselves and judge the task. So we're like not credentialists and we don't use the, like how well you're a raconteur. We look at how well you do a very task. It's very similar to like the job task. And um, the people I have are like people who did very well at that task. I guess I'd say that like the majority of people I've worked with are really superb and excellent. A few people are not so great, but people who are not so great often they like leave on their own. I don't know. I mean, they don't want to do the project. It's just not a good fit. It's not a good fit. I mean, I don't know. I think usually... Usually, but I mean, I guess, I guess now, I don't know, it's hard to think because now pretty much everyone who approaches me who wants to work on a project, they pretty much know what I'm interested in working on and then they know what we do and they are self-motivated, which is why they approached me. And so I feel like we've just gotten so many good people. And then I think I'm like, we're, we are the only people who have a Zoom meeting that's fun. Can I, can we agree? Yeah, it is fun. I, I will attest to the, it's funness, <laughs> I think. You know, it's a couple times a week, and normally a couple times a week you don't want to go to a meeting, but I I do like our meetings. They're, I, they're really good. Yeah, And I think I that just shows, yeah. like, the quality of people that show up. And yeah. I think maybe that comes back to that whole, you know, do good things and do it often, and you attract good people as well. Yeah. Because you're not, you know, paying these people to be there. A lot of times... Only a few people. Reasons. Only a few people. Only a few people. <laughs> But, but the majority, you know, there's yeah. whatever, how many people on the list and, yeah. and on your website, like you're not paying no. really any of them no. and they all come and they all have their ideas. And sometimes they have tons of ideas, you know, yes. it's chock full of ideas. So. And sometimes like Milos, they have bad ideas. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I, you know, I love having him there because there's some people who like to argue back a lot. Um, but isn't that good? So they strengthen is, the paper yeah. and, um. You know, they're different personalities. I pride myself types. on being one of those people. Yes, I always say it's 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 always better when you're there. It's more lively. Um, but it's good. I mean, you have to – if the person's not going to push back in your team meeting, the first person to be pushing back can't be a reviewer too. That's too late. You know, you need to have somebody tell you earlier what are the limits and flaws. And, you know, sometimes they're addressable, but sometimes they're insurmountable. We abandon those, move on. Yeah. 
And speaking of which, how do you make sure, because you give everybody a lot of independence. And in fact, most people come with their own ideas and they you know, are developing their own things, but your name, you know, you're developing this and looking at the analysis. And there's lots of times we go back and forth every single week, you know, working on the paper, writing it, whatnot. How do you make sure people who do go away are doing um, rigorous work that you're proud to sort of come back and work on and put your name on? I guess that's a good question. I guess it's the process of what happens in the meeting because if it's like, I'm trying to think. I mean, one, it's like all these people are rigorous people, so nobody does turns in trash. Uh, but in a few times in my life, somebody's turned in something bad. But usually you can see it. Like, I, I don't know how to put it. If you look at table one and you find all these inconsistencies, or you look at the result and you also have some sort of idea like what you kind of, what the field looks like, and you see these things like, oh, well, this if this is true, this can't be true. If this is true, this can't be true. Table one problems. I'm like, table one problems, I'm like, okay, go take another crack at it. They come back with table one problems. I'm like, okay, let me see the data set. Um, let me look at the data set and, uh, you know, things like that. And then, you know, I usually find it. But, you know, I'm sure I'm not perfect. Eventually, somebody might find a way to slip something through the cracks. But I think the product of working with excellent people and the product of being very, and you know our meetings, we it's not just me. We put the data up there and everyone looks at it yeah. and everyone looks for all the things that they think are wrong or flawed people or fishy. People don't want to believe that because you publish so many papers, but we're, our meetings are so productive. We're right, at times we're writing the paper yes, together we write the paper on together. the screen, yes. doing the analysis. Sometimes I've pulled our data and put it up, you know, in real yes. time and put it up on the yes. screen. Like we're working on this together. This is not just, you know, as some people would say, like a paper mill. It's, it's paper like, mill. we're, <laughs> you know, like yes. you go away and you put your name on it. And whatnot, no, and it's we fine, are working but, on know, it. Yeah, developed we're, together, written together, and getting analyzed heated, together. Heated. Like for instance, just yesterday, was it yesterday with Timothy? Timothy has a revise and resubmit. And the reviewer wants us to do like a million things. And this guy, poor guy, he's working like night and day to do all this stuff. And then, well, it comes out like, you know, I don't know. I pushed him on trying to like redo the analysis yet one more time. And I could tell he didn't want to do it. <laughs> he didn't want to do it. But but then later after the call, he has emailed me to say he's working on it, working on it, working on it, um, and got some questions. It's tedious. Um, you know, I think that that, I don't know. It's also fun. Like, I don't know, hate to say it, but like, it's fun to keep yeah. looking at it different ways. Your analysis was fun. You had to teach yourself some new statistical method, didn't you? I, yeah, I mean, I learned it. Like I learned what Poisson regression was yes. in school, but like I never have to do it. And, you know, that was something that you said a lot to me as well. It's like, you don't have to know all these things to do the thing. Like you can learn in a position or you yeah. can learn in a lab experience by, by like, you know, you don't have to have all the answers right away. And that was the one project that I talk about a lot that I was not familiar with and I learned so much and it was actually really fun to kind of get go through because all those things are so much more meaningful to you when you're actually in the data and you want to do something versus when you're at school and they give you a clean data set and they're like here's the code now press enter yes <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I think school projects do a disservice and then I also think you know in the beginning of my career I was always like oh people and people always say and I agree with them like work with a good statistician Yes, you know, we have good statisticians that I've worked with. I know many good statisticians. Yes. But I also want to say, the more I even do it, I think one of the things we do is we, like, defer to the statistician. I think that's wrong, too. I think what you really need is, like, you need to really have a clear um, philosophical conception of the question, and then you force the statistician to persuade you that the statistical approach is right and if you disagree you argue tooth and nail with them until they find until you guys meet in the middle or you know um you figure out what works your push remember i didn't want to do the push on regression i want to do a different regression and then you yeah, talked me out yeah. of it yes right i know you wanted well, we to just said we couldn't like it's not i know well i know intact to run it that's well, cute, you kept but... arguing, but I was still adamant in a set in my way. And then I got Allison Haslam yes, on my and side. Yes, and then I know. And, and then, then you know, like, she knows her methods. So anything yes, else, and like, we, we agree with. <laughs> but yeah. You, won, you no, won, that won that battle. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so maybe last question. Last question. This is running a little yeah. long, but I guess I'll just end with how do you do it? How do you do it all? How do you, <laughs> that was a question all. on Twitter, but I thought it was a really good question because it's like, you're so productive, but in all different areas, you are saying, you know, you read fiction, you go cycling, like how do you do it? Do you like, death. are you going to tell us you wake up at 4am like some people do and write no. 
500 words or what is it? Tell us the secret. I don't know. I feel like you know better than more because you've seen me literally write an article in front of your eyes sometimes, right? It's pretty special. Well, I guess I guess I just a fast writer. I'm a fast talker, fast thinker, fast. I mean, I'm fast in these things, so I'm not spending. uh, Were you always fast or did it come with time and experience? I wasn't always fast. I, I mean, I think I was, I, I don't know. The rest of us hope. <laughs> I think I had to do, okay, well, I, I think of things that kind of changed who I was, I think. When I was in high school, I took a class. I think it was government. I forget the old, the teacher's name, Mr. Morrill, government. And one of the things was, homework assignment was summarize every Federalist paper. I don't know if you know, there's so many Federalist papers and we have to write, write a summary. And... um. Mm-hmm. I don't know what happened, but I, I somehow my summaries were like length. They weren't very short. They were kind of lengthy. I really wanted to summarize the ideas, and uh, it was like horrendous. I like I submitted like a two hundred page thing, like and other people were submitting like fifty pages. I was like, oh god, what did I do? You know, it's, it's a big project. And then I took philosophy class, and I was a procrastinator, and I would get to the end of the semester, and it was like, oh, I got pa- I have f- three philosophy classes, and each of them have papers due, and the papers are like fifteen pages, twenty page, you know, all those pages to do. And so then I literally in like one or two nights had to write all these essays. And so I think what you do is you get comfortable writing quickly, uh, re- let never letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. That's another important thing. That's a big one, yeah. That's hard. Um, w- think about the problem when you're walking, running, biking, and then write it later when it's really sort of crisp in your mind, long periods of thinking, short periods of writing. Um, I don't know. I think those are it mostly. You know me. Yeah. I'm a, I'm like when when something really interests me, I'm very motivated to work on it. Yeah. Border I I don't want to say obsessed, but yeah, you know, it's it's like a healthy obsession. It's like this Well, is the I'll, thing I'll forget gonna... to eat lunch or easily if I'm working on yeah. something if I'm really interested in and uh um And also our meetings are super productive. Like people, you know, it's amazing how much can get done. Each person comes with their questions, analysis, yes. answers. And we're just ticking down the list. Like there is not a lot of time for, you know, whatever. I mean, sometimes we chat, but like, yes. you know, someone will butt in and say, okay, we, it's time to start, start working. But, you know, I think the difference between our meetings and other meetings is that um, we don't let people say things that are not like just talk for the sake of talking. Everybody who says anything just gets cut down by someone else. <laughs> it's, I feel like. Yeah. Even me, Sorry. if I ever start going on some rant, you all, especially you, you don't, you keep me to task if I have to finish the yeah. paper or something. Yeah, I think so can we get fine. back to work? We, yeah. You're only here for, you know, we only have an hour. Let's like bust yeah. out some work. But, Often. Yeah, and surround yourself with good people that are doing good work. That helps too. That helps. So this was fun. Anything else do you want to say? No, I mean, I Before think it leave. was academics i guess i would I say i have a lot more but i think we're running long <laughs> i don't know i guess the, the one thing that i wanted to talk about maybe we'll talk about some other time is um i don't know i feel like the other thing the other misconception is people always like well who's going to support you and who's going to help you like people are asking the wrong questions maybe that's the whole way to put it don't ask the question what do i need to do to be promoted who's going to help me who's going to sponsor me assume how to mentor yeah yeah how, to, how assume no one is going to help you Okay, that's how a lot of us feel, that no one is helping. You know, no one is going to help you. You'll be lucky if you don't have saboteurs. You know, you'll be lucky you don't have people trying to screw you over. Okay, assume that, you know, don't care about getting going up the rungs of the ladder. Just really think about what do you really enjoy doing? What are you good at doing? Who do you enjoy talking to? Who do you want to talk to? And pursue the people you want to talk to more. Like I pursued Adam. I got his phone number. Now he can't avoid me. <laughs> um, even if he wants. Um and others, you know, Tito, Foho, it was a great mentor to me. And, and yeah, so, many, you know, I, yeah. And um, so, like, you know, work with the people you want to work with. Do the things you want to do. You know, you don't, I mean, if you if you want to generate original ideas, then yes, be a professor. But if you want to be a content creator, then be Z-Dog, you know, be Z-Dog. There's, uh, I have a lot of admiration, obviously, he's a good friend of mine. I have a lot of admiration for him. Um, he's really you know, good. But don't force it, like, I mean, I don't know. If you want to be a tweeter, be a tweeter. You know, there are some people like that. But, you know, if you want to be promoted for being a tweeter, don't be surprised that the system doesn't, that's not what the way the world works, you know. Just like, you know, you don't get to be a doctor by painting paintings. I mean, you have to take care of patients. That's what it means. Right. So uh, these things. And I guess I'd say, like, improve yourself and ignore, ignore others. And this is, this is very, very, very inward looking. 
cynical. Well, it is. It's also, I think that's like the takeaway message is at least that's what I'm taking away is that it's about what you really want to do. And if you're coming up against the system and the system is, you know, not working to your advantage and, and causing you anxiety and angst, then maybe it's time to really look at if you fit with what you want to do within that system. And if you do, then, you know, go on. Right. But it's not all roses, but yeah, just think about what you want to do. What makes you happy? Thank you for doing and this. And on that note, yes, on that positive note. <laughs> on that positive note. Thanks so much. Thanks, Christina. <laughs>